Hey guys, it's Jesse from Comics The Gathering, and we're back for another episode of Friday Night Magic. This week, we got a special treat for you, being the month of October. I decided to uh, do a deck tech on something a little spooky, and that is my mono black um, demon ish tribal EDH deck. Um, the commander for this deck is Demon Lord Bells and Lock. Um, we're going to go over the choices of the deck. And I'll talk, uh, explain a little bit on each of them. So we're going to go ahead and start with the creatures here. Um, I have the deck in front of me. We're going to pull the cards up on screen as I talk about them. So then you guys can get a nice view. Um, let's start with the demons. Um, the reason we're demon tribal is I like it. Um, it's fun. Uh, we do have a Liliana's contract in here, so we can snag that win. But generally, I just, I like big, you know the the big black demon threats and uh it's a fun play style um and then bells and lock is a value engine so the deck is geared to uh you know draw as many cards as possible off of bells and lock without you know getting too stuck in the early game so um run through the demons here we have harvester of souls um a great draw engine um also you know it's a five five death touch threat uh, Rune Scarred Demon, you can't play any mono black deck or any deck that's in black, um, except for maybe a few tribes without playing this card. It's a 6-6 six, six flying tutor on a stick, like, that's, that's so good. A 6-6 six, six flyer that can get you any card, amazing. Um, Demon of Wailing Agonies, um, really, really good. Uh, one of the Commander exclusive print cards, this came out of the Obnixilis uh, mono black deck that came out uh, several years ago. Um, five mana, four four flyer, and then it has the lieutenant ability, um, getting plus two plus two, and uh, gaining the ability to when it deals combat damage to a player, make that player sack a creature as long as you control your general. So um, the uh, the next one is going to be a Villus Broker of Blood. Um, this is just raw draw power. And this can double up with some of my other draw power um, because I'm running things like Sign in Blood, Knight's Whisper, um, and other cards. You know, the anytime you lose life, you draw cards. That can turn into a lot of value really quick. Plus, he can shrink my opponent's creatures. And also, uh, an 8 8 flyer is nothing to scoff at. Um, probably one of the best cards in the deck. And uh, my copy, this is one of the few ones I won't display on screen. I'll pop it up there for you. Um, is uh, uh, signed, but it's not by the artist. Uh, this is signed by Krim from MTG Goldfish. Um, I met uh, I met Krim for the first time here at uh, Magic Fest Vegas a couple months ago. Great guy. Um, every I met everyone from the Goldfish crew except for Tomer. Um, he was on vacation at the time. Everyone was awesome. Um, generally, just a nice, great group of people. Um, but the Archfiend of Despair is. Um, a very brutal card. Uh, a 6-6 six, six flyer, your opponents can't gain life, and during the end step, any life that they would, uh, that they lost this turn, they then lose that same amount. So you can just end people if you're able to deal half of their life total as damage to them during a turn. They literally just die in the end phase. Um, Reaver Demon is my next one. Um, Again, expensive, but as long as you're casting him from your hand, uh, he's basically a board wipe. Uh, destroy all non-artifact, non-black creatures. They can't be regenerated. So, I mean, having a 6-6 six, six Flying Wrath that doesn't blow up your stuff seems really good. Um, one of my favorite cards uh, in the deck, in just in general, is Abyssal Persecutor. Um, it is a... Very undercosted 6-6 six, six Flying Trample for 4, but obviously that comes with a drawback. And that, that drawback being um, that I can't win the game and my opponents can't lose the game when he's on the board. Um, which makes for some very interesting game states where my opponents are at negative life and they're still alive. Um, some interesting plays that have happened was uh, I had beat down... A, um, it was a six player commander game and I had beat down four people into negatives um, 
and a uh, damnation was cast that uh, wiped the board and then simultaneously wiped uh, four people out of the game off of that damnation because it destroyed the Abyssal Persecutor keeping them in the game. Um, Overseer the Damned, 5-5 uh, five, five Flyer, uh, destroys a creature when it comes in and then also because I'm in mono black and I'm killing things, you know, each time a non-token creature an opponent controls dies, you need to make a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token. So you build up an army and, you know, you get a... Uh, Get some value there. Um, a uh, creature form of one of my favorite uh, characters in Magic the Gathering. Uh, Obnixil is Unshackled. Um, this card is amazing. A 4-4 uh, uh, Flying Trample. Each time your opponent searches their library, they have to sack a creature and lose 10 life. Whenever another creature dies, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Obnixilus. Like, that's really, really solid. Um... Reaper from the Abyss, uh, again, if, uh, big, you know, flying threat, 6-6 six, six flyer, um, and then also at the beginning of each end step, creature died this turn, destroy target, non-demon creature. So, you know, you can, uh, as long as nobody's stealing your demons and using them against you, you're usually pretty good with that. Um, Blood Gift Demon, he's a 5-4 flying threat, and he's draw power. Um, and then we're gonna, uh, we're getting into the non-demons now. Um, so this is probably one of, uh, my favorite cards of all time, and that is, uh, Avatar of Woe. Um, again, displaying this one in person because, uh, it is signed by the wonderful and illustrious RK Post. Um, one of a handful of cards I've gotten signed, uh, in this deck, and I absolutely love that, uh, he had a, a silver pen to sign this, this nice black and silver card. Um, looks great. Um, Nirkana Revenant, uh, a, a big aspect of uh, Mono Black is surprisingly uh, mana doubling and ramp. And this is one of the pieces in that. There's several other I'll get into. But each time you tap a swamp for mana, you generate an additional mana. And then it has the pump effect, but it's really here more for the fact that you can just start doubling up your mana because you can get out of hand. Um, while we're on the mana doublers, let me just hit those real quick. Um, we're also playing Cryptgast, of course. Um, you want to uh, get the mana doublers as often as possible. And then Magus of the Coffers as well. Um, again, being able to pay two and tap him to add a uh, black to your mana pool for each swamp you control can get really out of hand for your opponents when you're just generating so much more mana than they are. Um, uh, the next creature I'm playing is a Grave Titan. 6-6 um, six, six Death Touch, whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, it's gonna make uh, two, two, two zombie creature tokens. So that's really good. Um, just again, he's just putting out so much power and toughness continuously. Plus he is Death Touch, so, and he's a 6-6, six, six, so things generally tend to not get in his way they just let him come on through um there uh three black creatures left um we have uh erebos god of the dead um card draw and also again turning off my opponents from gaining life that's very very important to the strategy i want to if i'm draining your life i want to make sure you're not gaining it back um Ghoul Caller Gisa, I really like her as a way to blank my opponent's removal on my demons. If they go to, you know, kill my demons, I want to make sure I have, a, you know, some black mana up. And I'm able to just sack that creature to her and then get a whole army of 2-2 two, two zombies out of that. I think that's really, really good. Um, then the final one, of course, if you haven't realized it's coming, and that's Gary, Grey Merchant of Asphodel. Um, I've, again, this card has gotten out of hand before and i have made some big swings uh in the game i've actually put people out of the game off of a, a properly timed gray merchant before um the only card that i don't have in here when it comes to creatures that i think i i might want is um phyrexian obliterator and again that that four uh, mono black mana cost would be really nice with uh, devotion, some of the devotion cards I'm playing. Um, and then we have three creatures that are uh, 
colorless. Uh, we have an Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. Um, because we do a lot of the ramping, he is just a way to end people that may have gummed up the board enough that, you know, I'm not getting through on damage. I can just deck them. Um, uh, the other one is, I think it's just a staple of the format. Like, I don't play it in all of my decks, but you can slot it into any deck, and that's Worm Coil Engine. Um, I just... The card speaks for itself. Six mana for a 6-6 six, six with Death Touch and Life Link, and when it dies, you're going to make two three threes, one with Death Touch, one with Life Link. Like, it's just insane value. Um, and speaking of great value, we have Solemn uh, Simulacrum, the sad robot here. Um, again, there's no reason any commander deck doesn't play him. Uh, it, it, there just really isn't. Um... Getting into artifacts, since those were like the artifact creatures, um, I'm going to go over a couple pieces of equipment I have, um, because I don't play a ton of it. The first one I want to go over is Sword of the Animist. Um, uh, two mana uh, to cast, two mana to equip. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one. Um, and whenever it attacks, you get to get a basic land and put it on the battlefield tapped. Um, obviously, with all of my big uh, late-game threats, you want to ramp out mana as fast as possible. Um, so that is a uh, a great card at helping that. Oh, I just realized. I was like, uh, I guess I'll, I'll leave her back there. I'll leave her back there in that part. There's a, there is one creature I haven't gone over yet, but it's, it's also not a creature. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Swiftfoot Boots. Uh, obviously, uh, I do want to get some lightning greaves. I just don't have, have them. And I've had Swiftfoot, like multiple copies of Swiftfoot boots lying around. So, greaves are arguably basically the, the same thing. And I'd like to have both of them in here. Um, so, uh, and then we get into some really spicy equipments. Um, when you're in mono black, I feel these are staples. Like, you have to play them. And they're exuberantly powerful. And that is uh, Nightmare Lash and Lash Wrath. Both of them giving plus one, plus one to the equipped creature for each swamp you control. Lash Wrath, of course, comes along with a germ token, so it's automatically a creature when it enters. And then Lash Wrath uh, gets around being maybe not as good by having the equip cost of three life instead of mana, which I really like. Um, and then we have our Rampy Bits. Um, these are Mana Rocks and Mana Accelerators um, of the such. So we have the obvious Soul Ring. Um, we have a Hedron Archive um, because I can cash it in for cards later. We have a Thought Vessel because I can draw a lot of cards in this deck. Especially if Bells and Lock goes off the right way. So I want to not have to discard them to uh, hand size. Um, a new one. Uh, I actually just teched this in today. Because uh, I got one from Throne of Eldraine. And that's Herald uh, Heraldric Banner. Um, I actually slotted out Charcoal Diamond for this card. And there is an argument that maybe that is incorrect. Um, but it comes in untapped. Uh... Granted, a turn later, so the speed is about the same. Um, and then it also gives that, that little plus uh, one plus zero boost to all creatures you control of that color. And since I'm in a monocolor deck, I think that's a little bit better. And then the final one is something in that same vein for twice the price, and that's Cage Sun. Um, you can't play a monocolor deck without playing Cage Sun. It just straight up doubles your mana. It makes all of your creatures bigger. Um, just a really, really solid artifact. Um, then we get into the realm of things that are staples. And uh, the first one I have is Sensei's Divining Top. Obviously, Top is amazing. But you can't... Uh, you, I, I, again, it's one of those cards that I think you just include in every commander deck. Even though I personally don't. Um because of building restrictions, I, I, 
and also a little bit of the price point. The reprint isn't bad, but I can't stand the art of the reprint, so I will only play Kamigawa <laughs> Sensei's Divining Tops. Um, and then the final one bridges uh, the gap in from one format to the next, and that is the only legendary enchantment artifact I play in the deck, and that is Whip of Erebos. Um, Whip is amazing, being able to reanimate anything for a turn, uh, and most importantly, giving all my creatures a lifelink, because I pay a lot of life to do stuff in this deck, so I don't mind, uh, I don't mind paying out as long as I'm able to reap it back in later. Um, next we're gonna go into the enchantments, since that one was a enchantment artifact, it was both, um, that bridges between artifact and enchantment. Um, so we have a, a variety, we'll go over the one I mentioned already, and that's Liliana's Contract, um... It is a, a, a win con, but it's also draw power. Um, four cards for four life. I make that trade all the time. Um, that's just a really solid value engine. Um, and then having a built-in, you win the game, just if you happen to have four demons during your upkeep. Like, obviously, it's not hard for players and commander to prevent you from getting there. But you know what? Every, time, every now and then, you just, you might, the, the circumstances might align and you might get away with it. It might be something that they're, you know, it's, they're just not able to deal with. Um, Underworld Connections uh, is the next one. Again, uh, just got to keep drawing cards, keep the and uh, keep resources available um, so you don't run out. Especially if you build up all your mana and then you can't do anything with it. Like you want to have the ability to use all this value you're generating. Um, we kill a lot of things in mono black, and so I play black market again. Uh, it's more mana, and you know the, the greed is really heavy. Like I just I want to be able to sling these big demons and just use them as ways to end the game. So that's just one other way for me to generate the value needed to get there. Um, animate dead, of course. Uh, anytime you're dealing with mono black, you have to expect at least some bit of reanimation. Um, I don't play a ton. I do play the animate dead. Um, and that's just, you know, so a key piece goes away. I can get it back. Um, also, it can help me get maybe two demons into play in one turn and then give my, uh, if I already have another two, then, you know, my opponent might be in the situation where they're like, oh crap, we gotta, we gotta get one of his demons off the board or he's gonna win off contract. So, and then the final one is another win con, um, and that's Revel and Riches, and that's, I really like how this card interacts in Commander, um, it, it generates these treasure tokens, which, again, is more mana, but also, if you have ten or more, you win the game, and it's whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, which means none of your other opponents are gonna wrath, unless all of their boards are dead except yours. So it puts a weird restriction on the game where one person might be, you know, have a board assembled to win, and then you're just able to cast like a Damnation or a Toxic Deluge and then on your turn win. Um, so I really like that interaction there. Um, the creature I brought up that uh, was still in there, we were gonna talk about later, that's a Liliana Heretical Healer and She's a creature, but she also flips into a Planeswalker uh, if one of your creatures dies and brings a 2-2 zombie friend with her. Um, I think she's a very, very great card. And uh, you're going to notice there's several Lilianas in here. The next one being um, one of my favorites, and that's uh, Liliana of the Dark Realms. Um, again, the, the mono black ramp plan is really strong here uh being able to tutor up swamps so i'm hitting all my land drops and then finally getting that uh hopefully getting to that emblem that makes all my swamps tap for four that's absurd um the final liliana i play is uh dread horde general um she is absolutely a powerhouse being able to can uh add, give me more draw power with her static ability and then being able to just make you know an army of zombie uh, two two zombie tokens to uh push through in the game um the last planeswalker we play is i think probably the most simplistic one and that's obnixilis reignited he draws cards he kills creatures and he can curse an opponent so that every time uh <laughs> 
a uh, a player draws a card, they take two. And in a multiplayer game, that can get out of hand really quick. And what's funny is he's a very much a political tool. Um, you can use that to be like, hey, um, let me, don't hit my ob. I'm going to use it on our mutual threat here. And then all of a sudden we have a way to burn him out of the game. Um, especially if the uh, one of your allies is a blue player who maybe has like a blue sun zenith. You can be like, let me stick this obnixilis emblem on... You know, this guy, and then you blue suns for eight, and he's taking 16 damage because you drew eight cards. It gets out of hand. Um, next, we are in the realm of instants and sorceries. Um, all of my instances are targeted removal uh, in one form or another, so we're just going to uh, shuffle them around here and put them in ascending order of mana cost. The first one being the zero-costed Slaughter Pact. Um... I say zero cost because it is zero to cast, um, but there is the penalty of if during the next upkeep I don't pay three, uh, I lose the game. So it's basically, it's kind of like free, but it is, you know, you can use it when you're tapped out. And I really like that being able to have a piece of targeted removal to get rid of something problematic, even if I have to tap out to play something. Um, Tragic Slip is the next one. Um, obviously the minus one, minus one is not that great in Commander, but the negative 13, negative 13, if another creature died this turn, is phenomenal. Um, especially in Commander where you have, you know, Ulamogs and Emmacruels and, uh, Kozileks running around that can just be absolutely huge. Um, Ulamog in particular, this straight up just drops him in a hole and gets rid of him. Um... Next one I have is Reckless Spite. Um, you know, I don't mind trading off the life. Uh, if it means for three mana, I can actually kill two target creatures. So that's always a nice uh, nice little hit. Um, Varaska's Contempt. Um, this hits a creature or a Planeswalker, and it exiles it. So I get around even indestructibility things. Um, my final bit of targeted removal in the instant category and the final instant is one that technically costs five but usually only costs one and that is murderous cut um it hits literally any creature and um it usually only costs one mana and the delve cost of four cards from my graveyard so all in all generally a great card um we're gonna get into the sorceries next um i am going to uh do these in no particular order some of them are draw power some of them are targeted removal some of them are wraths um and i was too lazy to organize them so uh the first one is going to be ruinous path um a card that i think is rather underrated because not only does it hit creatures and pl or planeswalkers but also uh getting to pay the late game awaken cost can also be really good because you just get a random 4-4 four four out of that. And maybe it's, you know, post-wrath and people are starting to rebuild. And you're just able to, you only have like, you know, two or three cards. You kill somebody's Planeswalker and then you get a 4-4 four four out of it. it. You know, it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, Toxic Deluge, uh, probably one of the best wraths in here because it gets around indestructible. Um, and just destroys things that you have... You know, no business normally being able to handle. Um, speaking of Wraths, we have uh, obviously the Great Black Wrath of Maul Damnation. Um, you know, the, the card's self-explanatory. Um, we have a couple tutors. Uh, I have Diabolic Tutor in here. I have Demonic Tutor in here. Um, again, I'll show you guys Demonic Tutor. This one is, is signed by the original artist, um, Douglas Schuler. I actually got him to sign it at Magic Fest Vegas this year that was a lovely experience um we have a uh, killing wave um is a nice uh when i only have maybe two or three big demons out and i'm playing against like token decks or people are going wide with elves or something um being able to be like hey sacrifice each of your creatures unless you pay six or seven for them a piece most people sack down their whole board except for maybe one or two key pieces Whereas me keeping one or two demons for that price, it's not that bad. Also, again, 
you know the destruction synergies of my deck that can you know set off other things that let me handle that or draw cards or do other things um another great wrath mutilate um all creatures get minus one minus one for each swamp i control uh probably my favorite reanimation spell victimize um sack one of your creatures to get back two um and you can just get back anything like one creature for two so you sack a zombie token and you get back two demons from the graveyard and then you animate dead one and then before you know it you're you're winning off of you know uh uh liliana's contract so um promise of power another great card i really like um you know especially if you're able to cast this in the late game for nine where you're drawing five cards losing five life and then making a uh, demon whose power and toughness is equal to the number of cards in your hand. That's really, really strong. Um, I have a couple other uh, wraths here. Um, oh, uh, Necromantic Selection is really, really good because not only does it wipe the board clean, um, it also lets you reanimate one of the one best creature that was wiped this way. Um, as a zombie so you get to deprive your opponents of everything and then you know have the best creature left over um the next card is a game winning card um and that is command the dreadhorde uh command the dreadhorde straight up pull anything and just take damage equal to the cmc and you just you can amass crazy boards of this out of nowhere um I really think this card is very hard to play against, play around. Um, Torment of Hellfire is another fantastic card. Um, I've ironically died to this card as many times as I've killed people with it. And I mean literally my own copy. Um, I've Torment of Hell, Hellfire people out of the game for like X equal to 22. Um, but one of the games I played at uh, Vegas this year... Um, I played against a Saltai deck who was uh, a villainous wealth deck and he uh, he cast Gaunti and stole a card out of my deck because he's like, oh, you're playing mono black and you have all these big threats. I'm going to take a card from you. And it went around a whole turn cycle and then on his turn he cast my Torment of Hailfire for X equals 26 and yeah, no one survived. It literally straight up won him the game, which was unfortunate because it was, you know, my own card. Um, finally, the last three sorceries are going to be, uh, Read the Bones, uh, Knight's Whisper, and Sign in Blood. They all basically do about the same thing. They're all drawing two cards, costing you two life. Read the Bones comes with the scry. Um, and it's just, you know, to keep you digging for lands or whatever you're missing, get those pieces. Um, and that's going to wrap it up there. Uh, we have the lands left, um. So we're going to go over the lands, and then uh, that's going to be the deck. Um, so the first three lands I need to mention are probably the most important, and that is Urborg Tomb of Yagmoth, uh, Cabal Coffers, and Cabal Stronghold. I mean, you might be thinking to yourself, uh, why do you need Urborg if your deck is mostly swamps because you're mono black? And that's just to edge out and make the utility lands and even like Cabal Coffers um, count as swap, swamps as well, so you can get that extra value, and it's not costing you anything, it's just a land slot, and it turns itself into a swamp too. Um, and then obviously the other ones are huge, huge, uh, mana generators once you get going. Um, we play the one Bajuka Bog, um, obviously... You need some level of graveyard hate. You never know what you're going to encounter. Um, I play both Baron Moor and Polluted Mire as cycling lands. Um, just, you know, being able to dump those if you're, you know, in a good place on mana to get another card. And if not, you still get a land that just comes in tapped. Um, we have uh, Gyre Reach Sanitarium. Um, the loot house itself. Um, and that, that's a party loot. Everyone gets to loot. Um, and I don't necessarily mind that. Uh, it, it can be used as a nice political tool at a table of people to be like, hey, I'm just going to party loot. Everybody, we're going to draw cards. We're going to have a great time. And then before you know it, you're blowing up everybody's stuff. And those extra cards are drawing don't really matter. 
Um, Field of Ruin. Uh, Got to have a answer to uh, problematic lands, and that is definitely one of the better ones because you still get to search up a swamp. Um, I'm not playing uh, strip mine in here, and I probably should be. I just don't have any. Um, and I'll talk about some other lands that I want to be playing as well, as long as, as well as uh, some Throne of Eldraine cards I'm thinking about putting in here. Um, the next one is Blighted Fen. Um, again, it's just a utility land. Um, being able to, if your opponent only has the one creature, having an edict, edict effect on one of your lands um, to just make them sack that creature so that you don't have to deal with it. Um, obviously, the biggest, most included land outside of Command Tower in pretty much any... EDH deck, and that's Reliquary Tower. Um, no maximum hand size. Everybody wants that. Um, and the last two utility lands are uh, Westvale Abbey, because being able to uh, have a little token generator on a land is good um, to maybe clog up the ground, but also um, having the ability to flip this around into Ormondal, Prince of Profane, is insane, and he can close out games all on his own. Um, and the final utility land, if you haven't guessed it by now, is Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx. Um, you know, this is mono black, and obviously you're going to have devotion aspects to this deck. Um, when you get things like Cabal Coffers and Nykthos going together, things get really out of hand for your opponents. So you can just generate tons of mana off of Nykthos, and that lets you get to your bigger spells. Um, and then it is uh, 24 Swamps to close out the deck. Um, um, so there have been... I've been playing this deck for a long time. This was the second um, commander deck that I ever built. The first one was built out of the Derevi Precon. Um, and, uh, that was all the way back in 2014. Um, that deck was unfortunately stolen. And when I decided I was going to build something else, I bought the, uh, the mono black precon. The tw it was 2015. It was the new precon. You could have a planeswalker as your commander. People were losing their minds. And um, this deck has evolved out of that deck of, as I've taken time and spent money on upgrades and, you know, building it and tweaking it and honing it. Um, notable uh, cards from Throne of Eldraine that I'm thinking about including. Um, I think the two lands are a no-brainer, the Witch's Cottage and the um, Castle Lockwain. Um, because those can just slot in over swamps and they don't really change anything. Um, they just give you more utility in your land slot. And then, um, the one that is kind of like one of the standout cards, um, is, uh, the Cauldron. The Cauldron is absolutely absurd. Um, I don't have a way to really accelerate getting the mana cost reduced other than just the game playing and then getting to a point where hey i can cast this for a reasonable rate um but the reanimation ability is insane like it is absurdly good three mana and two life to reanimate anything in your graveyard and that's like it stays around unlike whip of erebus where you get exiled again um that's really really good and the, the only thing that is mildly prohibitive to it to it being in this deck is the mana cost. I mean, 12 mana would put it at the highest thing that I have in the deck. Um, and I don't quite know what I would slot out for it yet. So it's one of those cards that once I get it, I'll play around with it. I'll see where I want to slot it in. Anyhow, guys, thanks for watching. That's the deck tech. Um... If this is your first time on the channel, uh, we do uh, 
twice weekly videos. Friday, uh, the video you're currently watching is Friday Night Magic, and we do those obviously every Friday. And Monday, we have the Comics Gathering show, um, and that show is always subject to change, and it encompasses all of geek culture, um, and we just, you know, we have fun there. Um, so do be sure to give us a like and a subscribe. It really helps out the channel. We're trying to grow um, and hopefully turn this into something wonderful. Thank you guys for watching. Have a lovely day.